Sahran, salam alikum. Ayah sat kalim marabi, lakin del wakti. I do not speak uh, Arabic very well, but hopefully later on, so I have to switch to English at now, some sorry point, that. I can um, speak Arabic fluently. I will speak nice, to uh, about switch now to Arabic. Through play, or maybe play through learning in a way or another this very morning, and thank you very much for joining us. We have three different persons on the stage, three different personalities, three different backgrounds. I would like now to invite my two co-panelists, Ella Eckert and Zoran Popovic to join me on stage. So, um, because we're going to talk about learning through play and because of course Ladies first, I would like first of all to ask Dr. Ella Eckert here, who comes from Germany, to introduce herself briefly before we start with the presentations. Ella, please, you have the floor. Well, I started my career as a home language teacher in Sweden, where I have lived for 30 years. And uh, then I came to know two children who came from a different background. And this was so astonishing. They were Montessori children and they were so different, very open-minded, very curious. And then I started to study this concept and I uh, went to training. I worked as a Montessori teacher, Montessori trainer, and now I'm chairman for the German Montessori Society. Thank you very much, Ella. Dr. Zoran Popovic, who is coming all the way from Seattle, Washington, but uh, is only flying from Washington, D.C. when coming to Qatar. Please, Zoran, introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm a, a director of Center for Game Science, uh, where uh, one of our main objectives is to figure out how to uh, uh, use uh, gameplay as the uh, primary framework uh, for learning that will not only enable anybody anywhere to learn about uh, anything that they would like to, uh, to learn about, but also empower them to be able to um, uh, feel like what they're learning is fun and they would like to uh, continue it for the rest of their lives. So um, that's the ultimate goal of the center. Thank you very much, Soran. Before I briefly introduce myself and give my presentation a few indications that you might find Interesting, so the session will be divided in two parts, basically. The first of all, there will be a small debate, a short debate between the panelists here, and after there will be a Q&A session uh, with, with you, participants in the room, and as you know, new this year at WISE via MyWISE and Twitter, um, questions we get during, during the session. Um, in order to make sure that your headsets uh, work correctly, please do not place any item in front of the remote, and you have all these informations on the screen anyway. As for the translation channels, they will also appear on the screen. So my name is Bruno de la Chiesa. As you can take it from my first name, I have a German origin. From my last name, I have an Italian origin. I have a French passport, I feel more or less European, and I've been working uh, for the last 12 years at the OECD, uh, based in Paris, and uh, teaching at Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, basically working on neuroscience and learning, educational neuroscience, sometimes code, but my background is in uh, linguistics, especially social linguistics and um, didactics of languages. And today, I want to introduce this discussion very briefly with a small presentation based on neuroscience called Playing the Glass Bead Game. First of all, everybody should know that brain research is as interesting as it seems, as interesting as it is is not likely to solve any educational problem. It's not the role of science to solve educational problems. It's the role of science to inform decision makers, researchers, practitioners, teachers about what we know 
about, in that case, the way the brain works, that is, the way the brain learns, but not to make decisions on what to do. This is the role of ethics, not the role of science. However, it doesn't mean that it's not interesting at all, because findings from brain research in cognitive neuroscience can at least shed new lights on old issues, raise new questions, and inform ideology-dominated debates of pre-scientific nature. The brain challenge, as we called it, when we started this back in 99, so it's almost a teenager now, um, is the following. We consider at the OECD and at Harvard that a dialogue is necessary between the neuroscientific community on the one hand and the education community on the other, on an international level, in order to reply to questions of technical and scientific nature, of social and economic nature, and of ethical and political nature. So there are there's very complex issues there. However, we have learned more in the last 20 years about the brain, about the human brain and the way it works, again, the way it learns, than in the whole history of mankind before. Therefore, as educators, we cannot possibly ignore what brain research and neuroscience has to tell us. Why now? Well, as I said, we've learned a lot in the last 20 years, but basically, it's only the beginning. What neuroscience is about to discover, the insights that are going to come from this area are so overwhelming that it's something not only educators, but nobody can really ignore for the decades to come. And this is, of course, the result of the impact brain technologies have made on how we can observe the working brain, the learning brain, which was not possible before without scanners. You know, when you have to work with dead brains, the brain of dead people, it's extremely difficult to determine how the brain actually learns. So we have to deal with discoveries with educational implications, especially with the notions of brain plasticity, very good news for us all, as you will see, and of brain periodicity, the sensitive periods within our brains in order to learn something specific or to acquire specific skills. And I would like here, given the topic of this debate, to underline the crucial roles, the crucial role, sorry, emotions are playing in learning processes. For decades and decades, if not centuries, learning was considered a mere cognitive process where emotions were, at best, neglected. However, the more we know about the brain, the more we discover how far, how deep, uh, emotions are influencing learning. Positive emotions, negative emotions. Pleasure, joy of learning is the positive thing. Leads to motivation, certain forms of very positive motivation. One example of, of a very negative emotion that is related to learning, but in a bad way, is fear. As soon as you experience fear or anxiety, you don't learn that well anymore. Of course, that's common sense, but now, thanks to brain imaging technologies, we can even show why. So this is the sort of fMRI scanners that have been used in the last two decades, and which allow us to more or less locate what's happening in the brain when the brain is performing a specific task. Like, for instance, um, how the brain operates which brain circuitry, which brain areas are involved in social decision-making. These fMRI scanners are huge machines, which are extremely heavy to use. And uh, fortunately, some Japanese colleagues have developed um, a new technology based on near-infrared um, devices called optical topography, and now they have prototypes of WOT, wearable optical topography. You can see that on the screen. This guy wears something that actually measures the activity in his neocortex. Uh, that means the part of the brain that is specific to human beings. The good thing about this is that it's very light. It's 
you can wear it as a cap or as a kefir for that matter and after a while you completely forget that you have it on your on your on your skull with this there is no noise as we call it no interference in the measurements and of course we start to be able to measure the activity of two brains when communicating with one another which is of course extremely relevant for education and for a lot of other purposes well this is a synapse very simplified you certainly know what a synapse is a connection between two neurons and we have millions and millions of synapses in our in our brain learning from a brain perspective from a neurological perspective from uh, well at cell level if you wish has to do with synapses you develop synapses new ones you prune old ones you reinforce synapses and you weaken some others depending on what happens when you learn and since the brain learns constantly the brain is a lifelong learning device you can't help but have the brain learn all the time that means that you are configurating reconfigurating deconfigurating again and again your synaptic connectivity and as Eric Kandel, the Nobel Prize for Medicine, said once, uh, synaptic changes parallel behavioral changes. With this in mind, we have calculated the development of synapses and the elimination of synapses across the lifespan. As you can see here, in infancy, it is particularly strong. But of course, it continues throughout life. When I was a child, I remember that I was told once in a biology course that we had a certain number of neurons at the very beginning of our life and we would lose thousands and thousands of neurons on a daily basis which is absolutely frightening i thought gosh i'm getting more and more stupid with every day is this possible well when you are 12 or 13 you observe the world around you and you have a lot of proof for that fortunately it is not the case not only well yes we lose neurons every day but this doesn't matter that much because we create new ones and intelligence, whatever you understand under this word, is not related to uh, a number of neurons. Plasticity and periodicity in a few words. There are particular, particular sensitive periods that exist for different types of learning, meaning that depending on what you want to learn, the knowledge you want to acquire or the skills you want to develop there are periods in life which are better than others. You learn easier, you learn faster, but it's only an optimal period. It is not a critical period as if the window would slam shut afterwards. Meaning that you can learn anything at any age. Not the same way, sometimes it will require more effort and etc. But some things are learned actually better as an adult than as a child. Emotions, as I said, and again, this is directly related to the topic today, play a crucial role in the learning process, if not the essential role, because it's related to motivation and related to the environment. In the remarkable plasticity of the brain makes it a lifelong learning device, as I said, and it makes remediation for learning disorders possible, even if not diagnosed at a very early age. If we have time, I will give a details for that in other words and in spite of what the proverb the saying uh, has uh, has it you can teach an old dog new tricks it is possible at any age look at that isn't that beautiful it takes a while to for the dog to acquire that skill and the other animals too but basically that's the idea as an example literacy in the brain you know our brain was developed to acquire language to understand and produce language but it was not developed for reading or writing for that matter because these are relatively new um, human activities and we don't have the evolution time necessary already to have reading and uh, writing in our brains so sensitive periods for language learning exists as i said early periods of life for phonetics and phonology, a bit longer for grammar and syntax. And the good news, the, the older you get, the better you get at learning semantics and vocabulary. 
As far as reading is concerned, many cases of dyslexia due to difficulties with phonemic awareness could be diagnosed very early, in Finland especially, by uh, Heike Lutinen and his team, as early as the age of one year. And of course, after that, since the early diagnosis is there, it was possible to have these kids go through a plain video in order to uh, have phonemic training in order to improve the coding skills. We will heard about uh, video games afterwards with my two colleagues. If you want more details about this, you can find that in the book uh, published four years ago already by the OECD, available in several languages and very soon in Arabic. We're very happy about that, called Understanding the Brain, the Birth of a Learning Science. The learning brain is a product of interaction between nature, genetics on the one hand, and nurture, the environment on the other. So the debate about you know, nature and nurture is now over from a scientific point of view, at least as far as the brain is concerned. Beyond the importance of emotions and motivational stimuli, we have the importance of learning environment and play. There is solid scientific evidence to show that um, emotionally positive approaches to learning are more efficient than others. To support the idea of making learning pleasurable even at school, children love to learn, they love to understand, they love to discover the world around them. They experience the joy of learning on a daily basis. Unfortunately, very often when they reach schools, they, then at school they don't experience the same pleasure anymore. Why is that? What is it we should do about it? And, of course, this scientific evidence to support or not doesn't support sometimes existing theories about learning and teaching, theories and practices. And it shows why and how successful teaching methods work. Now, my question is, could learning and playing be one and the same thing? Not only learning through play, but learning as playing. This is an idea that Hermann Hesse, the German-Swiss author who became the a Nobel Prize winner in literature in uh, 1952, if I remember well, but I'm not sure, maybe in the, in the last uh, 40s. In his book, Das Glasperlenspiel, the glass bead game developed, among other things. The glass bead game is a game of the mind, which brings together knowledge, skills, know-how, beauty, art, faith, and a lot of other elements that are so essential to human beings. It's very important because it's the, our future which is at stake. After one look at this planet, any visitor from outer space would say, I want to see the manager. This is not from me. This is from William Burroughs. Unfortunately, he died before I could meet with him. But if I had met with him one day, I would have told him, look, Bill, I completely agree with you, but you know what? We, human beings, are in charge of this planet. That's the point. We are the managers. Anyway, I hope that we will have a great discussion now, not only based on neuroscience, but have some sort like a rising brain with which we'll be able to dance together with our brains. I believe in collective intelligence in order to make our brains stronger, stronger not to forget spiritual uplift, but keep our feet on Earth anyway, because this is where we have to act and deal. Thank you very much. Shukran Awe. Now we'd like to ask um, Ella Eckert to follow me and present our, her work in the Montessori context. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when preparing this uh, session, I was looking uh, in the beginning at the word of play, and uh, in German we don't have any difference between play or game, there is only one word for it. And when I looked it up, play says or meant from the beginning something like movement, activity, and dance. And that led me directly to, to Montessori, to the Montessori approach. And uh, then I looked up, well, what, or I th was thinking about what are the essentials of play. And the essentials of play are that it's voluntarily um, chosen, and it's not time li limited, it gives joy, 
it is autonomous and it's self-organized. And I think these uh, five essentials also are very similar to what you find in Montessori education. And uh, Montessori, as many of you may know, um, was created by an Italian medical doctor, so there we have similarities. And she based her concept on uh, observations, on many, many observations from all over the world, children all over the world of many different cultures, many different social backgrounds, and she came to uh, the result that it's very important to let the children um, l learn according to their developmental needs. And there again, she already spoke about sensitive period, periods, which you mentioned, and she talked about absorbent learning, that very young children take in all impressions which they get from their environment, uh, which is very important because they take in both the positive and the negative impressions, which makes a, gives us a very big responsibility as educators. So, and then uh, she was, um, she identified something which she called the polarization of attention. Later by Shiksent Mihail, it was called the flow phenomenon. And, uh, these were the essentials she based her concept on. And uh, the concept means that there is, has to be a very special learning environment. And this learning environment has to be special for the different age groups. It's very different for the ones, for the younger ones from zero to three, for three to six, six to 12, 12 to 18. And then already uh, you can know, m many people believe that Montessori, the Montessori approach is something for very young children. This is not so, but uh, many uh, environments are for younger children and the more you get up into uh, older ages, the less you will find of Montessori. But her concept was meant for the ages up to 18 and there are some very fine examples for even these older children. So um, the essentials are uh, a very special learning environment. And then the possibility in this environment, which is like a frame, let the children choose what they want to learn according to their inner development and according to their interests. And this, I think, is what uh, neuroscientists today confirm as well, that uh, uh, you learn best when you learn according to your inner interests in your environments and this is nothing we as educators can directly tell what are the inner needs right now but we can prepare a, uh, an environment and we can by observing try to find out what what might be appropriate for a child and then we present certain activities working cycles to the children uh, as an introduction and after the introduction the children are let free to take on the activity, to, to go deep into it, to concentrate. And uh, that children are uh, able to concentrate at a very early age, that also is something which Montessori found it would, and which was, was uh, revolutionary in the, in the days when she started her first Casa dei Bambini, her first children's house, which she called a children's house since everything was appropriate to children uh, of age three to six in those days in 1907 when she, when she started this first environment for children. And, and it was so rev revolutionary that uh, started in 1907, already um, seven, eight years later, there were Montessori children houses uh, in all the European capitals. You had one in Stockholm, you had in, uh, it in Brussels, in Vienna and so on. And even in the United States, it started very early because people were so astonished to see that so small children um, could take care of their own environment and they were concentrated, they were uh, very responsible in taking care of things and they were getting doing things independently, which uh, before people had not believed would be possible for younger children. So I would like to show you a few um, photos from, uh, Mon from Montessori environments. You see this is uh, the Montessori environment for the very young children 
and uh, you have a child which has been introduced to a material and there you see after the introduction um, this young lady who is her educator, she sits next to it, so she is close but she lets the child work independently and she is as a guide and if necessary then she will help and encourage but only if necessary because um, that is very typical for Montessori. Uh, Montessori's opinion was that we often are obstacles in the development of children and we should let them get independent, uh, well, in small steps, of course. This is my favorite, one of my favorite pictures because I find there you see so clearly how a very young child of two years of age can go deeply into an activity, like in this case, baking Montessori muffins. And uh, this little guy in a Stockholm Montessori infant community, he came in one morning when I was observing and he put on this baker's hat and by having done that, everybody, everybody knew what he was going to do this morning. Um, this was not at all the first time he did it, he had been introduced to this activity before, but then uh, he wanted to repeat. And repetition, to, to be able to do activities and working cycles as long as you feel it's necessary. And that nobody else can tell, it's your inner need who tells you how, how often you need to do activities. And here you find a child which really is um, deep in this activity with all his senses. But to be able to do this at an early age, of course, the environment must be very well structured and structured and carefully prepared. So what he found before he started was this preparation, where everything was uh, prepared, small bowls. Here you see them uh, empty, because every morning when the directress comes, comes into the environment, then she fills in flour and, and, mil and milk. So everything is prepared, otherwise it would not be possible for such a young child to, to work in this way. But if it's prepared well, then a child of this age can really um, try and, and do such a working cycle, which is quite uh, complicated, which is not so easy for young children. But they are very, very interested in it, and. By doing it, they come into a deep concentration and they come into a deep concentration which involves their whole, their whole small persons. So you be, uh, the, better, the, the better you have uh, this environment, the easier it becomes to work in it. You see some more pictures from environments for very small children. Here it's for language acquisition, which is very important. I think it's much more important now than it used to be earlier to enrich vocabulary in a classified way. And here you see Montessori's um, quotation once more. The fundamental concept of the, for the educator is not to become an obstacle in the development of the child. And that's what many adults very often do without knowing it, with, without being aware. So here you see an environment for older children, very well structured for elementary children, but already for elementary children the classroom is not enough. They need to go out of the classroom, do research on their own, but when being back in the classroom they need an environment which is well structured, but which also is uh, beautiful, is inviting and is inspiring and I think that is something which we in many schools don't find, an inspiring development. Be because we spend so much time as teachers and children in, in schools so it's very important and that helps uh, children to become creative, to, to want to know, to want to do work on their own or together with some other, uh, other uh, children. Here you see the botany corner and here you see some children working together 
which very often happens for uh, the elementary children, they work together. What is very special in the Montessori elementary approach is that there are given cosmic tales which introduce the children into big overviews of human knowledge, like the coming of life, and it's presented in story form and with the help of timelines and charts and experiments, children are able to understand this big picture uh, which is told by the teacher, and then on their own go into details and do research on certain spe species. And they can afterwards always see it in a big context. I think this is what uh, neuroscientists also tell us. It's so important to learn in context instead of learning facts as uh, is often done in traditional schools. The coming of life, which is, um, well, a very big issue for young children at age six or seven, but it gives them uh, so much to know about and it, it stills their hunger for knowledge, which is enormous in those years. And by stilling their hunger, uh, they really keep their motivation, which otherwise so easily is lost. Then, of course, they can do very much of uh, individual studies um, after having been presented to this to the, to the story, to the big panorama, to the big overview. Two more last sentences. For the older children, the uh, even older children or adolescents between 12 and 18, a learning environment within the school is not longer the appropriate thing, Montessori said. They need to be uh, outside in, uh, in the countryside. They need to have a study center where they can experience much more than just from, from a point of view, uh, from the school perspective. They need to do it the other way around, not start with the theory and go into practice, but starting with the practice, um, uh, taking care of animals, taking care of households, uh, taking care of a bed and breakfast place, and then having, um, and then doing studies about it. So th maybe we go into more when we are discussing. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ella. Um, now, Zoran will speak about specific games that are not necessarily meant for the uh, school context, but more general. And uh, if you manage to uh, bridge some sort of neuroscientific view and the flow idea that you presented and everything, that would be great. If you don't, we'll help you with that. I'll Go try. Zora. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, what I will tell you about is uh, something that has basically happened in the last three years. But in some sense, uh, as you will see, uh, yeah, I think it holds some uh, really exciting promise. So this is sort of uh, the standard way things are designed in terms of what you would present to people and how they learn. You know, there's there's a certain amount of knowledge on any kind of topic, uh, then that's basically presented through some kind of presentation tools to students who are then, people are supposed to absorb it in some way and produce outcomes uh, as a result. And I guess in many ways what I'm trying to do is change this process in, in some way and look at it from this perspective. Um, and it's, it's actually very related to uh, what has just been said in Montessori as well. Is, so don't start with a theory that, uh, and ways in which you would present it to someone, but basically start with people and give them the incentive structure to find out things for themselves, okay? Out of that, then allow them to become experts from which discoveries and education will emerge, okay? And so in many ways, this must have been how we were doing it uh, in the beginning, right? But at some point, we've got there's so much knowledge uh, that, it's, uh, that maybe somebody would say, well, let me give you the shortcuts. But it turns out, without this incentive structure, uh, things become really, really hard. And as you saw, there, there are reasons for, for that, even on a neural level. Um, so, uh, just to tell you one example uh, of what we tried to do three years ago, uh, we started with a really hard problem. How can we solve really hard scientific problems in biochemistry uh, by people who know nothing about biochemistry? Okay? 
as you can imagine, you know, nobody wanted to fund that research project in the, initially because it was a really uh, uh, daunting project. But the, but the idea is there is a way in which biochemistry really is like a 3D puzzle. And if that is so, so many of us are capable of doing puzzles. So why can't we do biochemistry by solving puzzles? So uh, that gave rise to uh, a very elaborate, massive, mass scale social uh, gameplay uh, in Folded. Just out of curiosity, have any of you heard of Folded before? Okay, we have, we have some people initially. So anyway, it's, uh, you can uh, look it up, there's only one Folded game out there. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's a game that turns biochemistry into Tetris on steroids. It's basically, you treat, try to pack this really complex structure in the smallest amount of space. And you have all sorts of fancy things like rubber bands, those purple things. You can pull it, push it in many different ways uh, and, and try to solve the problem. There, there are thousands of people solving it at the same time. So you have ways of socializing, uh, collecting groups, uh, solving it competing against other groups uh, and all sorts of things uh, uh, that emerge from that. So, um, so this has been going on for two and a half years and now I'm happy to report some outcomes out of this. So this is top 20 players in Folded. So, so you can basically see that um, uh, more than three quarters of people had practically no background in biochemistry whatsoever. And these are our best players, okay? Uh, and then there's only one or two that are professionally involved and they're at the bottom of this top 20 list, okay? So, so the best per people that were able to solve the hardest problems here are those that uh, for one reason or another knew no nothing about the biochemistry prior to being engaged in this game. So everything that they've learned about this process is through the game itself. Okay, so uh, what were they actually able to do? Well, it turns out... Uh, these folks with no biochemistry information have now published two papers in Nature. This is sort of the most eminent, the eminent publication uh, uh, journal uh, for science, and we had the, this was our submission for the for the front cover uh, for the for the Nature uh, journal, uh, and we actually there are actually now three other discoveries that that we haven't even published yet, including a third Nature uh, submission that we're, that we're submitting. Um, but what's exciting now is that there are actually experiments created from Folded uh, that are now scientists are waiting on to figure out what to do next in, in their wet lab experiments. So we've actually changed the way the scientists think about what next to try in the lab because we're able to generate uh, innovative creative solutions that scientists themselves cannot do. So in, in many ways actually by our estimates we've increased the number of proteomics expertise uh, uh, by maybe four times. There's four times more people in the world doing these kinds of puzzles than they were three years ago. Uh, and this is just a single game that was capable of doing this. Um, okay, so now we're actually doing this towards drug design. There are, there are the same experts that we just created. Uh, they're now doing uh, designing drugs uh, or protein-based drugs that they are going to hopefully be the next set of uh, generic drugs that uh, uh, that, that will be able to help uh, a whole bunch of diseases. We're working on enzymes, which are also proteins, uh, that can produce sort of novel biofuel uh, processes or, or be able to store energy in a chemical processes and, and sort of uh, address certain issues in global warming. We're even developing a new game now, which is around nanotechnology. It's about how to build machines on a molecular level that can walk along and transport atoms and molecules from one place in a cell to another. Um, and this is, as you can imagine, it's a great play space. It's only on a molecular level, and it has direct relationship to science. Um, but perhaps the biggest uh, discovery, really, that Folded did is, is this ability uh, to bring novices to the level of expertise. It's a narrow expertise, but it's an expertise that's now able to publish all these papers, and there's no lab in the world that has three nature papers in, in less than two years. I mean, this, this is kind of a different way. In, the science has been accelerated by sheer volume of uh, people that were able to, through plasticity of their brain, uh, get themselves to the point of, of high level of performance on the scientific problem. So the question is, how can we do education that way? And so I started looking at mathematics specifically and say, can I eradicate some of these big bottlenecks in mathematics using the same kind of technology. So if you look at sort of, and this is sort of a U.S. National Mathematics Advisory, everybody in the States 
has, uh, has sort of really scratching their heads about all these kids lost in middle school and in elementary school. Nobody thinks math and science is exciting by the end of middle school. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, it's not cool, it's too hard, uh, and it's not exciting. So, so why, why would anyone ever do it? So my goal, in, in many ways, is to try to change that. So uh, I started sort of thinking about how can I do uh, STEM learning. STEM means science, technology, education, and math. Um, and then I realized I can't really do that. I need, really need to, because there's not enough data. So what we're trying to do is actually have the game give us data on how to best to teach kids on every one of those specific aspects. And so the idea is basically there's an online world that's accessible through, to, on mobile device anywhere in the world. Uh, and what it's able to do is gather millions and millions of samples of space of all possible confusions that every child can reach on any concept, be it fractions, proportional reason, geometry. And then, it, by varying the game for every individual kid, it can basically say, well, for this type of kid, with this type of learning preference and this type of environment, the best set of next challenges within the game uh, that experimentally we've found to quickest lead to the light bulb, the realization uh, of, of that concept, is this. So basically we learn through the process of huge number of kids naturally playing the game because that's the world that they gravitate towards. We're able to sort of gather enough data to know exactly what the right thing to do is for every child in terms of removing every one of those bottlenecks. So that's the project that we're doing. Um, we actually just released the first prototype. It's already won, uh, just, just this month, it won a Japan prize uh, it, as, as sort of the... Uh, uh, the, the best uh, elementary school uh, the, uh, sort of uh, entertainment uh, piece. Uh, and so the idea is you're saving these uh, uh, little animals out in, in the outer space, but you're doing it through splitting lasers, and, and through that you're actually learning how, um, uh, how, how different fractions are used uh, and what are the conceptual ways uh, that you can use fractions. The exciting thing about this is it can be used in a classroom too. So here, this is what the teacher sees, or this is what the parent sees. So you can basically, after gameplay for a while, you can see for every type of complex expression, uh, you can basically see how much the game thinks that the kid is understanding it. And even more interestingly, uh, what, the, what the game is, thinks is the best set of things to sort of uh, present to, to the child as problems subsequently. And you can see these sliders at the end. What, what, what's possible there is the teacher can just say, well, I'm going to really teach this aspect of, of, of fraction next. So I'm just going to pull that slider up high. And then next time the kids play at home, they get more and more of that information, which is in synchrony with the, the, the lecture that's actually being presented. Um, similarly, we now have a project that actually is mapping the, the entire set of textbook problems into multiple game, game worlds. Because you know, one game is not going to appeal to every single kid. But if we have four or five games for every one of those concepts, we should be able to sort of um, uh, do a whole bunch of really exciting things. So if you can roll the video, uh, I, can, I can give you a little uh, glimpse of what, what's, what's possible. So imagine a teacher uh, setting up a, a homework, but it's actually typing a set of problems in this kind of interface. Uh, and then this interface is capable of, of producing a level that exactly requires that mathematical expression to be uh, computed in order to be solved. So in this case, I can change the difficulty uh, maybe for a different age group, and I can automatically generate sort of huge number of these levels, all of which will require a certain level of mathematical sophistication to solve. So what that allows, and you can add sort of arbitrary set of expressions, and so every one of these games is capable of, of sort of mapping directly a mathematical concept into an embedded game world. Uh, what that allows us to do is no longer think about homework, but home play. You can basically assign a whole bunch of uh, problems for kids that are just done through uh, playing the game at home. When, when the, they're done at the next, uh, uh, next day, the teacher can just look at that portal and understand exactly how much each kid understands on every level. No test is necessary. There's no reason to uh, sort of intimidate ch children with specific written things. They will all th only tell them how inefficient they are on one level or another. Everything is, is there in the game. All they're doing is they're playing. We know how play is important. Uh, they're, they're assessed in a more accurate way uh, than, than the standard way. And so the, the, 
the key question then is, uh, how effective can this be uh, in, in a way in which it transfers to real world problems? And so uh, one thing that we're doing is uh, trying to see if you can solve these problems in this game, can you also have exactly the same problems solved in a different game, in a di very different context? If the answer is yes, that means you understand it on a much higher level and you're able to sort of uh, solve it in many different contexts, meaning you can also solve it in a real world problem more likely. Uh, of course, one of the weaknesses here is we're focusing on fractions and proportional reasoning, but what about all the other concepts in mathematics and science, right? How can we cover that? So I'm actually working on, on a crowdsourcing mechanism uh, to actually enable not just me, because there's no way I can do all the, all the gains for all the concepts, but I, we can enable many different people to use the same kind of methodology uh, to, let's, let's imagine like hundreds of inspired teachers around the world have very creative ideas of how to use that concept and present it in very interesting ways. They can be teamed up with game designers to actually design an, a compelling interface which is then gonna be tested by students and they can tell you, is this fun or is this ridiculous? You know, you, you will know that right away just based on how, how much they choose to play it. And then we're basically gonna close this cycle and do it uh, a number of different times until we populate the entire K-12 curriculum uh, with sort of a completely new uh, play-based uh, uh, way of presenting it uh, and, and assessing it. So that's, uh, that's basically what, uh, what we're really, really excited about doing in the next uh, four years. And um, um, I, I'm always open to anybody who's interested in joining that project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoran. So, uh, as far as I understand, not only you believe in collective intelligence, but you also rely on collective intelligence and inviting everybody here and their networks to participate in this effort of yours. Am I right? Yeah, no, absolutely. There is a... uh, collective intelligence is, uh, it, Folded definitely has shown this. I mean, uh, no single person can actually solve these problems nearly as well as, as a group of people can. It just shows every single puzzle we present, that's always the case. Uh, and it's, now I'm a firm believer that there's a, and that, that comes from people having different set of skills. If you have a skill, you can only do as well as that skill is required. If you have 10 people with different skills, you can do way more things than any individual person can do. I couldn't agree more. I always say 10 brains work better than one brain especially if they come from different backgrounds in terms of geography, culture, disciplines, etc. Now, that <clears throat> Ella, you mentioned the notion of flow at some stage, which I, I, I won't be able to pronounce the, uh, the name of the psychologist who, uh, well, you, you might be able to do that if you speak Hungarian, who developed that, but could you please say a few more, more words about this, how it relates to play and how it relates to learning in your approach before we give the floor? To, uh, to the audience. I've, I found it very interesting to see that Montessori had developed this phenomenon, which she called uh, polarization of attention, that the child is very, very concentrated on something he is uh, working with and uh, doesn't observe anything which is happening around. And once um, it's satis satisfied doing this activity, then it's like huh, coming out of a dream. It's not like being very, uh, uh, very tired after that. And uh, so Montessori um, e experienced this for children. And this man uh, coming from a Hunga hungry, Hungary uh, background and working in Chicago, um, his name is Mikhail. Chick sent me high. You can either you can either pronounce it or you can write it. <laughs> it's diff you it's managed, difficult. You managed. But uh, he ex he made uh, many studies experiencing it for adults and uh, trying to find out what is it that challenges people to be uh, extreme uh, mountaineers or to be whatever. And and he said the most important thing is that the challenges challenges are just appropriate. In Swedish we have a word which is logom. It's not too much, it's not too little. It's an, a challenge which is right uh, directly at this, at this point. And then it can happen that you get into this flow where you are taken up with all your personality. Thank you very much. 
sounds extremely credible to me at the very least. So uh, now we have already one question in the audience and then another one. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Nazi Hamdi. I'm from Jordan, from the University of Jordan. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, about the Mensuri method. It's very useful, but is it affordable for the poor? I have another question also. It's very useful to learn through play and games, but would that enable you to do the GRE, for example, in the future, to get admitted to college, to receive degrees. Thank you. Thank you very much for these questions. So the first one is probably for you, Leila. Uh, we discussed it already, the fact that not only we represent a small part of the world here on the stage, but also can, what, what can we say about the social dimensions of what we are actually doing as far as Montessori is concerned? That's the first question. Well, as a matter of fact, um, it, people often think it's something for just rich countries and rich environments. But uh, I have studied uh, the Tibetan children villages where Montessori has been applied since the 1960s, very early. And um, they, do, they make all their materials, all their environment on their own. And uh, so it is possible. Even I know that in some African countries, Kenya, they, w they are working uh, uh, with the Montessori concept and uh, even there they are doing everything which is needed. They are preparing it when they are trained as teachers. So I think yes, it's possible. And this, the second question was more for you, Soren, I think. Yeah, I guess I can uh, comment on that. Um, uh, yeah, I actually believe so. I mean, there, there are several reasons uh, uh, why uh, uh, these kinds of environments can fully be, be I mean, first of all, as, as you see, I'm trying to cover the entire curriculum. Uh, in the States, uh, uh, there's this thing called Common Core. People have actually identified this, the, the set of concepts, so there's about 150 of them, uh, that one requires uh, to finish high school, for example. Um, what, what I'm planning to do is actually develop at least four games that are on each one of those concepts, so you can measure the transfer of all of those things. And the studies, we already have a 10,000 kids a study where um, there, some group of kids are playing the game, some are not playing the game. They have a pre and post test on the actual, uh, basically it's a post, it's a, te it's a true test uh, that they would be giving in school and we're actually measuring exactly what's the near, uh, mid and, sh and long term transfer, which is transfer is really basically the ability to uh, use what you've learned and apply it to a whole bunch of different things. It turns out test is one of those things you can apply it to, but really the more important thing is can you apply it to life, right? And so that, this is where I think it's even more important because I can, you can have people get a high school diploma but still don't understand the key concepts that they really need uh, to do uh, college. In fact, in, in the States, there's a set of community colleges that all they do in first two years is, is remediation. They need to figure out all the things that people have missed in a previous uh, uh, education in order for them to continue uh, on. And, it, and basically the studies show you cannot start without actually removing all these misconceptions earlier. And so in many ways, it's, th there's something even more fundamental than just passing the exams. It's, it's really truly, truly uh, understanding this such that you can uh, uh, be able to uh, take on challenges in college and onwards. Uh, in addition, of course, is do you really feel like you're a scientist? Can that feeling really be uh, somehow generated through your, uh, through your self-identification with the set of problems you're solving? And I think that kind of incentive structure is capable of doing that when your environment and everything else around you tells you, no, you're not good enough. No, you cannot do that. Thank you very much, Doran. Uh, just very quickly, can you answer a question from the internet we have here? Don't you think games should focus on the social aspect and playing with peers? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, should I answer that now? Or is, uh, okay. Please do, um, very quickly. So, um, yeah, uh, everything that we, uh, we certainly design is, is, is that. I mean, it's, uh, uh, first of all, uh, some of these games that you've just seen, the older kids have the ability to generate levels that younger kids are then solving and they're evaluated based on how useful their levels are for 
uh, the ability for younger kids to understand the concept. So there's basically, there, even after they understand all these concepts, they're actually invited to participate into active development of the games further, such that they're pulled more into sort of this social development on not just themselves, but the whole community of younger kids that are about to pass through the same process themselves. Thank you very much. So we have four more questions now, five. The lady in black and white there, please. And then after the two gentlemen behind in blue and uh, black. Yes, please, can you please stand up and introduce yourself before? Uh, my name yeah. is Dalia Sliman. I'm the president of the Egyptian Autistic Society. Um, I'm very excited about what you're doing because a few months ago we got donated a bunch of iPads. And within two weeks, I managed to teach the autistic children things I haven't been able to teach them in maybe two years, just because they're such visual learners and doing it through game and not through communicating with me, which is very difficult with them, was very, very easy for them. And some of these children uh, are being mainstreamed into regular schools. So we end up taking the curriculums of the mainstream schools and changing them into visual material and pictures. But now that I think about it, if we do it into, in games, it would work miraculously. So are you thinking of developing something for special needs or for autistic children in particular? I'm trying to apply this thing. I mean, I really would like to... The, re the nice thing about the games and a mobile device that now in Africa, a smartphone can be under $35, I just heard. I think two years from now, it'll be a lot less still, is that it, it, no matter what kind of education you might have, accessibility is there. Uh, certainly, the autistic kids uh, are some of the best game players in the world. I don't know if you know that, but, but uh, somehow, uh, you know, they, they're capable of, of doing stuff that... <laughs> Uh, that that uh, that sort of ordinary people certainly are not able to do. So of course it seems like a very natural uh, channel for them. I would love to do sort of uh, potential uh, studies, and you should uh, uh, talk to me afterwards uh, about pot potential trials that we can do. That. One thing I I wanted to mention is the first day I gave these iPads to the children and the teachers. The teachers sat there going, "Where's the start button?" While the kids just like figured out the game and went as if you know they've had it all their lives. So you're right. Digital generation, probably. <laughs> then we have the, uh, the gentleman in blue. Uh, we just mentioned Africa. I suppose you come from here. So we, would you please stand up and introduce Thank yourself? You. Thank you. This is Akio Luide. I'm Vice Chancellor, University of Ilona in Nigeria. Um, as good as play method is, I think we have to define at what stage of the education ladder we have to stop it. Life itself is not about play. Life is much more difficult than playing. And are we not going to give the impression to the students that you can get on well in life by playing all your life? And for that reason, I believe that the play method should be for those who need the play method. Those, there are some who will find the play method uh, very uninteresting and, in fact, very unrealistic. I believe that we should not just generalize because some of the students, have, you'll find out that there, are, there might be few who need this pampering play method to get the message to them, but there are some who will find it, who it will be more appropriate for them to go directly to real life. And lastly, I also believe that some of these methods can be applied only in the lower schools, lower levels of education, rather than at the higher level, because we might, in the process of playing, lose the real work. Thank you. Okay, who wants to go for it? Please, a quick answer. And, and quick questions, because we have only 10 minutes left, I was told, so, and we have still have five or six questions to go. Zoran, I, I, be quick or be dead. I will, <laughs> all right, I'll try not to be dead. Uh, so uh, I, th I think you raise an interesting question. I think that uh, it's true that in many different places you don't actually need an incentive structure. People feel that school itself is a privilege and it's an exciting thing. Um, and uh, I'm not, it's, the games themselves doesn't, don't necessarily mean it's all frivolous. You don't need to actually work. Uh, in fact, I'm working on a game now uh, that, that trains tenacity. It basically it doesn't teach you a concept. It teaches you that if you persist 
and you, and you work on something for a very long time, the results would come. And in many ways, uh, that's something that if you can empower that into younger children, um, that can be more powerful than any individual fraction or whatever you want to teach. But how do you how do you do that? What if your parents cannot instill that into you? What if what if your situation is such that you don't actually have the circumstances that allow you to do that? This kind of virtual world perhaps provides another alternative uh, for these kinds of lessons that don't uh, that don't uh, that might appear frivolous, but they really have deep implications. The other thing I would say is that. Folded is all about adults who never had any background in this thing playing and advancing the space of science. So I would not, I would certainly not agree with you that it's only about uh, for kids. Thank you, Zoran. A question for you, uh, Ayla, from, from the internet. Do you happen to have some statistical evidence of the effectiveness of Montessori method in early development learning compared to other methods? And if yes, can you make that available in a way or another? Okay, in, in 30 seconds. Well, there has been a study done by an American lady, and her name is Angelina Lillard, and she uh, did a, uh, an empirical study and published it under the title Montessori, the Science Behind the Genius. So you're welcome to look at that. Thank you very much. So, <coughs> gentlemen here. Yes, My please. name is Hilmi Qureshi. I am from India, and I come from a company called ZMQ. I have a question for Dr. Popovich. That, uh, uh, what do you think that what can be the role of game-based playing to solve critical challenges like uh, like uh, um, like reducing illiteracy or like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know um, um, like solving the problems and, and leading to behavior change, inculcating scientific thinking, especially in the underprivileged masses, and that too through the mobile phones. Persistence and tenacity uh, games that we're trying to develop. We're also uh, uh, looking at uh, language and uh, and creativity. This is one thing that uh, we're particularly interested in. Just how can everybody uh, not just uh, believe that they could be creative, but actually, how, what are the mechanisms that creativity can actually be fostered uh, through gameplay? This is another uh, aspect that we're working on. And and in many ways, those are all about uh, how can you empower kids or adults uh, to see through this virtual world of what they're capable of and how plastic their mind is towards uh, ability to expand beyond. Uh, so uh, we're working on a lot of that stuff and my focus really is that games can access those uh, that just have a phone. Everybody with a phone should get state-of-the-art education that customized just for them. That's basically what I'm working on. Yeah. Thank you. We have four more questions. Lady there, gentleman, the lady here, and the gentleman here, and five minutes for both, for everything. So okay, please shoot. I'll go really quickly. Thank you. You, you know, um, sir, you lost me when you did that chart, uh, the second flow chart about not having knowledge. They became an expert and then they went to learn. I don't understand how you can become an expert and then search for knowledge. Can you just tell us what you mean by that? Uh, yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. Uh, it, the, the idea is that uh, before you give them any processed knowledge, give them the incentive to, un to start to wonder why and how. So what do they become expert at? Uh, they become, so in Folded, they became experts in biochemistry on particular structure prediction pr problems. So, uh, and then they go and learn more. Uh, that actually happens, yeah. Yes. They, they create okay. a huge number of Wikipedia okay. pages. They even have their own language of biochemistry that's different from biochemists that they have to okay. then map afterwards. Okay, yeah. that's brilliant. I think what you're doing is brilliant. My second question is, very quickly, you know when you uh, taught the kids the fractions in the game, did you actually do the next piece to see whether they could apply it to the real world? Uh, yeah, we're, we're doing all those tests now. So basically, yeah, uh, yeah. there's... No, I know, no, I don't mean giving them another game. I mean, from that game, when they learn that, f f you said they get can the they concept of... Can they go and, and, and in the real word world, do they have it? Yeah, that, uh, we don't have the actual data, but you the, don't the, have it. the data is now going to be collected over... Um, uh, we're doing a study with Disney, 
and Sesame Street, who are both going to uh, distribute this thing on, on millions of kids. And then we're going to have school, uh, schools and teachers. In fact, I'm interested in hearing anybody who's, uh, who has a school system that, that is willing to uh, help us out in actually doing those studies. But that's still out. Uh, the question is still out. Okay, we're waiting for the uh, results with impatience. The gentleman here and then the lady here. Thank you. Three minutes to go. Uh, yes, uh, first, thank you very much. It was very interesting. And my question is, have you got any special uh, measure, uh, um, ways of measuring the success uh, of uh, not younger children in the kindergarten? I don't think it is very necessary in Montessori system and anywhere. And when they are in secondary school, is it possible, that, um, do you have some special, not trivial methods of measuring uh, their success? I think often when they uh, finish Montessori school, because many children finish after elementary and then they go on to traditional types of school and uh, they, they uh, manage very, very well because they have learned very um, important things. They have learned how to plan their work, how to carry it out, how to finish. So, hmm? I don't, well, excuse me, that was not the question. I understand that Montessori system is brilliant and it is developing as well as any games. I just wanted to say there are standards, even uh, not uh, very strict standards, even if I'm a parent and the parent gives a child to some, somewhere, he wants to know how f far uh, has he gone in the um, staircase of success. And um, I know there are a lot of tests in trivial education. And I am a director of a school and I know all this. And I like, I want to make Montessori and game system not an extra curriculum thing. And I want to put it into the curriculum. And I don't mm, know the methods of measuring uh, the standard. Uh, well, um, uh, did the child get the standard or didn't he? Uh, is he successful or isn't he? Because it is very, it's a brilliant idea that a, a student must be a subject of education and he's uh, going by himself and he is not mm, tortured and he is not uh, pushed and uh, pressed. But um, uh, I'm a social um, representative and I want to know uh, whether he's successful or not. Are there any special methods, not uh, but for uh, tests, exams, and so on. Well, I think I have to intervene here, if you allow me. This requires a complete debate, because the question you're asking is whether a specific approach to teaching and learning can actually fit with standardized tests that are imposed from elsewhere. And that's a completely different question in my, in my view. We don't have time to discuss that now. Sorry for this, but I understand your point. But Now, we have two last questions. The lady with a silver scarf here. Yes, please. And the gentleman here. There are two last questions if we allow two more minutes to finish this. Is that all right? Thank you, boss. I am Adla Sabri and I am running a school for uh, learning difficulty students and students with slow learning. I want to ask uh, about the Montessori. Uh, if, is there uh, any do you think it is proper for uh, teaching the disabled children? And if they accept disabled children in their uh, system? Another question for the other uh, gentleman. It is about uh, the autistic children have the barrier of uh, uh, making uh, communication with other people. So they are uh, socially behavior disordered. Uh, and uh, using the computer and games uh, with uh, no interaction will deepen their disability in communication. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who starts? So many, many Montessori schools accept children with disabilities. Yes. Uh, and then if they are severely, uh, have, if they have severe problems, there are um, institutions which uh, train uh, Montessori therapists who can take up the work with these children. There is a center for that, for example, in Munich, 
which is excellent, and you might try to, to get into contact there. I would say that, um, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, that there, it could be potentially that, uh, that sort of virtual worlds do not actually uh, de uh, develop the specific things that they're, uh, the social interaction aspects, that they're, they're common to all the uh, autistic kids. Uh, however, it could be empowering them in, in the sense that it enables them to do stuff that is hindered through, uh, through their lack of social interaction. So it could be sort of uh, giving them the ability and the sense of knowing that they're actually capable of doing all these things. Uh, and then through that ability, perhaps they could be developing other social aspects of it. Thank you. And the last question from the gentleman in the second row. Yeah. My name is Hamad Abad Andalusi. I am a founder of an association called Partnership School Businesses. It is very easy, I think, uh, to create workshop in schools uh, for learning by games, uh, starting by elementary school. My question is, uh, how to implement this project? Do you have a kit with the requirement, with the equipment needed, and a guide for educators how to coach students? in this uh, workshop? We are developing that. Starting next spring, we'll be actually pushing it through classrooms and we'll have actually specific. What we like to do is figure out what are the different ways in which teachers can use them. So you can use them in a classroom. You can basically say, uh, here are a whole bunch of things I want kids to learn. And then basically a teacher can say, um, I'm going to go from one note to another and help individual kids. They could just say, I'm going to teach the normal way and give the homeworks uh, in this particular way, or I can just basically completely let them play by themselves, or I can have them play about the concepts before I teach. And there, there are studies that show if, if they're actually inspired to learn about the topic without knowing anything about it first, uh, then they have almost 80% more uptake on the lecture themselves. It's called preparation for future learning. It's, a, it's sort of a new concept. So uh, there are many modalities to use this. What we're studying now is and in fact, I want to talk to inspired teachers who will tell me what are the best modalities of using it. Well, thank you very much, Zoran and Ella, again. Uh, one day, I think Albert Einstein said, uh, it is a miracle that the, na the natural human curiosity survives schooling. If we manage, after this discussion, which is only a start on learning through playing, to make sure that our children and our adults alike won't lose their natural curiosity completely and discover the joy of learning, the joy of understanding, the joy of memorizing and creating connections, then we won't have lost our time. I would like to thank you all very much for your participation and Ella and Zoran. Learning through play, let's play. Thank you. Shukran Awi.